Take up the offering. Like the 
Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You can be seated this evening. Amen. I love that song. I love lifting up the name of Jesus and recognizing how special, how sacred that name really is. Amen. It is wonderful to be back together in his house tonight. And we did have a wonderful time this morning. I'm so thankful for Jory's baptism, as has already been mentioned, and but also just the move of God's Spirit and to see some people entering in that I haven't seen before and reaching out to God. It's a beautiful thing to see. I'm thankful for that. Amen. And it's great to be back together tonight and uh, to have some with us here for the first time. Good to have Carrie Ann and Taylor here with us tonight. Amen. They're co-workers of Brad's and Karen's. Glad to have them here with us tonight. Amen. Also great to see Uche and little Kieran here tonight back with us. Amen. I can't wait to see him again and see how he's grown, but to great for, to see them tonight in God's house. Amen. God is so good. I'll give you uh, some announcements here tonight, and uh, then I would like us to, before uh, Sister Macy comes, she's going to minister to us tonight, but I would like us to, uh, to pray uh, for Sam as he starts on this new uh, adventure in life, that to God would be with him. And uh, I know he has been uh, jittery about sleeping already, and so we're going to pray that God will calm him down. Amen. But uh, remember, on Tuesday night, uh, we because of the wedding, we'll be not having a Tuesday night service, and so just remember that. We'll be back on the following Tuesday night, back together next weekend. But then also other things coming up. The uh, hyphen district hyphen retreat is August 11th to 13th, and then the men's empowerment conference is from the 17th to the 19th. Always a great time. On the 26th, we have the hyphen paddleboarding event, and. And then on the 27th is the annual corn boil. I'll have our Sunday morning service, and then the afternoon at 4 p.m. will be the corn boil. Always a fantastic time. And then there is a sign-up sheet in the back for our upcoming uh, discipleship course. It'll be taking place from August 29th to October the 3rd on Tuesday nights. And so if you haven't been a part of those, you'll want to sign up to be a part of that. Always a fantastic time, and I'm thankful for the growth in so many lives through discipleship. And then also I do want to just add to that that on September the 2nd, we will be having, it's a Saturday, and uh, so on that Saturday afternoon, we'll be having a uh, shower celebration for Sam and Omega and uh, kind of officially welcoming them as as a couple, obviously Sam's been around for a while, but uh, Omega is going to come and to be a part of, of this church over the rest of 2023 and Lord willing in the future as well. But um, for, for now, it's just this until they go off to New Zealand for school. And so anyway, um, we'll be talking more about that. But um, I would ask Brother Sam, just come on up here. And if you want to gather around and help us pray, let's just pray that God would help Sam. This is obviously a big step in life. And it is outside of the decision to serve the Lord. The decision uh, who you're going to marry is the most important decision you make. And so we want God's blessing and favor on them. In the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray right now.
Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, thank you for your prayers. We appreciate that so much. Amen. And uh, of course, we're here tonight to hear from God and to connect with Him. So I'm looking forward to God's Word here tonight. I'm going to invite Sister Macy to come, and she's going to minister to us here tonight. I'm so thankful for this young lady and for her walk with God and what she brings to share with us. Amen. And I pray God's blessing on you tonight. Sister Macy, God bless. Praise the Lord. <laughs> um, well, it's, it's definitely great to be on the team, um, the ministry team, even though I feel like I never measure up, but it's okay. We're definitely a blessed church to have what we have. We receive a lot from Pastor Abbott and from my husband. He's pretty great, too. <laughs> <laughs> Might be my favorite preacher, maybe. <laughs> so tonight... I want to talk about God's battle plan. So I'm going to talk about a few. There's, there's so many scriptures in the Bible that talk about the fear of the Lord. Like so many. So many. I could, tell, I could read every single one to you, uh, to you tonight, but you'd probably end up falling asleep because there are so many. So I'm not going to do that. But I am going to give you a few scriptures before I get to my main one. And... I think before I do that, we'll go ahead and pray. So, Pastor Abbott, if you'd pray. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, so it's going to be rapid fire because there's a bunch. Not, not too many, but pay attention. <laughs> Okay, Proverbs 9 and 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 1 and 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs 8, 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Proverbs 14, 27, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. Luke 1, 50, his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Proverbs 19, 23, the fear of the Lord leads to life, and he who has it will abide in satisfaction. He will not be visited with evil. Psalms 25, 14, the friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. Proverbs 14, 26, in the fear of the Lord there is strong confidence, and his children will have a place of refuge. Psalm 19, 9, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. 2 Corinthians 7 and 1, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Psalms 103, 13, As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Psalms 145 and 19, He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He also will bear, hear their cry and save them. Just a couple more. Psalms 128, 1 through 4. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy, and it shall be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house, your children like olive plants all around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. And the last one, Ecclesiastes 12 and 13. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So it's our whole duty. It's our whole job is to fear God. So if you're able to keep up with that, it basically covers everything. And more. There's more. It covers everything. So I, it's just my opinion that if there's a topic or a command or a lifestyle practice that is that all-inclusive and, and covers that much of the Bible... And it hangs upon so many promises from God, I think it might be pretty important. It might be pretty relevant to us. And so tonight I'm going to use Joshua as an example of what it means to fear God and how we go about it. So this will be Joshua 5, 13 through 15. So just for some context, this is after Moses' death. Joshua's in charge of the children of Israel. So they've crossed the Jordan River and they're about to conquer the land of Canaan. They haven't bought, fought a single battle yet. 
So they're going into their very first battle, which is Jericho. So Joshua 5, 13 through 15. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, Are you for us? Are you for our enemy, adversaries or enemies? And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So this is Joshua. He's a great leader, he's a great warrior. And he's ready to conquer. He's out there scouting. And he's, he's looking at this land that God has promised him. He's ready to take this land. And Jericho is first up on the list of places he's been called and anointed to demolish in the name of the Lord. So while he's scouting and he's checking out this area and he's drawing up his battle plan in his mind, he sees a soldier standing in front of him with his sword drawn. Now we've come a long way from the times of using swords, right? So I kind of think of it as like a gun. So being from Texas, I'm a little bit more familiar with guns. <laughs> Not so much swords. <laughs> and that's very much unlike here. <laughs> like I would, could go into a grocery store or a wedding and see somebody's got con uh, concealed carry on their hip. Do you see that here? Because I don't. That, that doesn't happen here. <laughs> But if I were to walk in this store and to see the same guy with a gun on his hip, but to see him with a gun in his hand, my reaction might be a little different. I might not say, oh, that's whatever. I might, the alarm bells would probably be going off. Where's the threat? Are you the threat? Should I be hiding? Should I be ducking? What should I be doing? Am I going to die? <laughs> This may be going, what's going on in Joshua's mind. I mean, he's a warrior. He sees somebody with their sword, and he's thinking, is it time to fight? What's going on? He's probably a lot less panicky than I would be. But I'm sure he's ready, he's ready to square up with this guy. So this posture that this soldier has, it signifies that he's ready for battle. So Joshua, doing what any brave man would do, he walked right up to him. And the Bible doesn't say this, but... I have to imagine that he's either got his sword out or he's got his hand there. He's thinking, what's going on? Are we about ready to duel? So these two dangerous weapons being held by two strong, fearless soldiers, I would think makes for a very tense atmosphere. But Joshua was a leader that recognized that when the battle's at hand, you go right up to the enemy face to face. He wasn't intimidated. He wasn't afraid of this unknown sword-wielding soldier. He addresses him immediately with a simple and straightforward question. And this is a question that determines whether Joshua is going to use his sword for the first fatality in the battle against Jericho. And that question is, are you for us or are you for our adversaries? This was obviously a soldier Joshua had never seen before. So he needed to clear things up before he did anything drastic. But he's in battle mode. He knew what was ahead of him, and he knew what was behind him. And he's in battle mode because he recognized that God had placed some things in front of him that are his for the taking. But they have to be physically claimed and possessed. He was ready to go forward and to take action, to possess the things that God has promised. We might have to get a little violent sometimes. So backing down from an opposition in front of us is just not an option. Whether it's an obvious opposition, or it's even potential, Joshua faces it head on, and he forces it to identify itself. He doesn't avoid, he doesn't run and hide, he doesn't get 100 meters back hollering out this question, afraid to get too close, afraid to cause any, any problems. It's direct confrontation with anything that stands between him and what God has promised him. And as we learn to live in the fear of the Lord and learn how to go boldly about possessing the things God has intended for us, we must learn to face and identify things that are in our way. We don't have time to sit idly by and allow things to get in the way of what God has promised. As we face a new opportunity in life, or as God, if God's called you to ministry, or there's a big decision that you have to make, you're at a crossroads, which we have all throughout our lives. We come, we come to small crossroads, big crossroads, but there's always that question. 
there's something in the way of that. What are you? Are you for me? Or are you for the enemy? In other words, do you plan to move me forward towards the purpose of God's plan in my life? Or are you a distractor? Do you build up the things of God in my life? Or do you tear down the promise that I've made? And then there's also the thoughts that we have. Intimidation of the enemy. And a help guide for this is Philippians 4 and 8. Whatsoever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there be any, if there is excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So does this thing standing in front of you pass that test? Because if it doesn't line up with that scripture, then it doesn't need to be getting in the way. If your thoughts don't line up with it, then it's getting in the way of where God is taking you. So it's time to quit giving time and and energy to distractions and be clear about the purpose of God in our lives and how we're supposed to pursue it. And I'm not saying that we need to be anti-everything and boycott all the world and all the things that don't line up with this. That's not my point. Avoiding everything in in the world isn't a great way to show the love of God to others. Secluding ourselves and avoiding people who don't believe the same wouldn't be a very effective witnessing approach. However, we are meant to be on the wall watching carefully about what's in front of us and what we allow into our lives. Because some things just can't, they can live in our presence, but some things, they just have to die. So Joshua said, are you for us or are you for the enemy? Simple question. Joshua stands ready to confront this guy, and he awaits an answer of either you or them. But he gets neither one. (laughs) And I love this kind of sound snarky response. So he says, are you, are you with us or the enemy? And he says, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, which one? Neither. I'm not with you, and I'm not with your enemy. I'm independent of both of you. He says to Joshua, I am the commander of the Lord's army, and now I have come. It's not just you and the enemy present anymore. I'd like to present a new party who is now present. So it's important for us to realize that the enforcement of God's will is not contingent on our plans. God's will is its own independent thing. So we can either be in alignment with it or we can be out of alignment with it. But it doesn't change it. This is why the commander of the Lord's army said, no, I'm not here with you or with them. I'm here to represent the will of Jehovah God Almighty. So Joshua, if you're in alignment with him, then we're all good. However, I'm not here to serve you. I'm here to serve him. It's a very important distinction because we all have to remember that God's will isn't to serve us, but rather we serve at the pleasure of his will. So immediately when this commander of the Lord's army said this, Joshua realized what was happening. He recognized that he was in the presence of an authority that was much higher than he was. Joshua recognized he was not in charge of this meeting any longer, despite the fact that he's the leader of Israel, and despite the fact that he's been called, chosen, and anointed by God to bring them into the promised land and lead this huge military conquest. It's on him. He's the leader. It's the same guy in a few chapters later that speaks directly to the sun and tells it to stop. I mean, Joshua's big and bad. He's not lacking authority or power, but Joshua had enough sense to realize in this moment that he was in the presence of an authority higher than him. And that realization is central to our understanding of the fear of the Lord. So Joshua recognized instantly he was no longer calling the shots. He immediately responded in a way that that you should respond when in the presence of a higher power. The Bible says that Joshua immediately fell on his face and he worshipped. He bowed himself to the ground and he showed reverence and submission to the commander of the Lord's army. And when he recognized that God's presence was standing before him, his immediate response was a self-directed, self-initiated demotion of his position. I'm no longer in charge. You are in charge. I am voluntarily positioning myself to demonstrate that I recognize this. I'm voluntarily bowing before you to show reverence for your presence and the truth that your presence reflects a hierarchy where I am no longer at the top. That recognition and realization and then a voluntary response 
of repositioning before the presence of God is how we begin the process of living in the fear of God. I see you, Lord. I recognize your authority. I acknowledge that you are Lord of this and every situation, and I am submitted to you. I'm not, and not only am I submitted to you in my words, in my acknowledgement, but I'm taking action and I'm making a demonstration of my recognition of your authority right here, right now. I'm bowing myself before you, not only to show you I'm at your mercy, but I'm at your service. Many people acknowledge God with their words. It's not that hard. But they also, there's many that do very little else to give him his proper place. The prophet Isaiah talked about those people. And then Jesus himself quoted Isaiah when he addressed the Pharisees in Matthew 15 and 8. He said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They say they know who I am, but actions do not align with their words. They say, Lord, you're in charge, but they still try to stay in charge. It's one thing to say God's in charge and you're submitted to him, but it's a totally other thing to completely vacate the seat of authority in your life and let God actually have it. So this is a man who recognizes who he is and who God is. I love this story because I think it makes such a clear demonstration of what it means to live in the fear of the Lord. A man in charge. I mean, like I've, I've, I've focused on that. He's a man in charge that recognizes the presence of God and he immediately acknowledges the authority God brings and he repositions himself into a place of submission and humility and acceptance of that authority. So as we learn how to live this life, living in the fear of the Lord, it's so important to see what happens in this moment. Understand that the man standing before Joshua never asked him to bow. He never asked him to kneel or to show reverence. He didn't ask anything of Joshua. It wasn't an obligation for him to show obedience, and God didn't forcefully push him down. It was Joshua. It was him realizing the authority that was present, and that simply their presence demanded a demonstration of submission, not because he asked for it, but because it's that important to get your flesh and your mind and your spirit aligned properly in the presence of God. The fact is, is that it wasn't about the man standing in front of him. It was about Joshua. For one thing, if Joshua wasn't in living in the fear of the Lord, he might have made the mistake, got a little too excited, and tried to run the sword through the guy. And I don't think that would have worked out too well for him, <laughs> since he was probably an angel. <laughs> but God knows that he's in charge. He's not confused about this. And he doesn't need our worship to survive. He doesn't need it to operate. But sometimes, even though we know God is in charge, our flesh tries to fight against it. And that is why this is so important. That's why this visual demonstration is so necessary. We acknowledge that God is present, but we have to then demonstrate to our flesh. It's for our flesh to say, we're getting in alignment. I'm going to fix myself in this position because I want God's authority. It's one thing to say, yes, I know, I know you're an authority, but... We have to give him the space. We have to physically give him the space to operate. There are a few things that are as powerful in your life as a voluntary repositioning of submission in presence of God. When you tell your flesh, God is in charge at this moment and I'm not. And there's a powerful alignment that takes place in the atmosphere. And I have to say, it's one of the hardest things for us to do. It doesn't matter where you are in your walk with God, how old you are, we hate giving up control. We hate it. We like to think we know what's best for us. We know the right plan of action. I got it. I know. I know. My way is the best way. I've got it handled. If you're honest with yourself right now, you know what I'm saying is true. <laughs> we hold our opinion very highly. We feel we're capable. But the willingness that Joshua had and that we need to grab a hold of and to recognize and to admit that I don't care how good I am at this, I know that I need God's direction in my life. And I want to point out that Joshua was in a role he was really good at. He was a really good leader. But, and he was very capable of leading the children of Israel. But he knew, regardless of that, the one in charge is here, and his plan is much better. 
And I also want to point out that for Joshua, this was different. He didn't have the same access to God's spirit that we have now. If you have the Holy Ghost, it is dwelling in you. And the Bible says that it's there to teach us and to guide us. That means that it is always there. And that means that our encounters with God's spirit are not situational and few and far between like they were for Joshua. For us, we walk in the spirit. And we're surrounded by the presence of God. It lives within us to direct our steps and to teach us. Therefore, we are always, always, every day, every moment at the service of the Spirit of God. Everything we do has to be filtered through his authority in our lives and our submission to that authority. Do all that you do in the name of Jesus. That means to do it all under the authority of his constant presence in your life. It, and it doesn't mean do what you want and then pray over it in Jesus' name. No. <laughs> We get that confused sometimes. I do. And we wonder why things didn't turn out well. It's like, but I prayed in Jesus' name. (laughs) What it means is that we must pause and we must recognize his presence and his authority. What it means when it says, do it in his name, means get yourself out of the way and do what he says to do because you're not in charge. Solomon said, This in Proverbs 3 and 6, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight or he will direct your paths. So in every single area of your life, acknowledge that he's present for you to lean on when you need it and realize that he's there all the time and he's in charge all the time. That is how to start to live in the fear of the Lord. And that's when the long list of blessings and promises start to be poured out in our lives. Living in the fear of the Lord isn't about being afraid of God hurting us or afraid of him to discipline us. That's not what that means, but it's about showing reverence to him. It's about living with a deep, a deep concern that we keep things in proper alignment. It's not that I'm terrified of God. It's not that I think he's going to strike me down or hurt me, but I'm, I'm very afraid of what happens in my life when I try to be God and try to be in control. So Joshua positions himself to demonstrate that he knows who's in charge, and then he does this very simple thing. It says in Joshua 5 and 14, And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? What do you want me to do, God? All of my plans are being set aside. The table's being cleared. I'm, I'm I'm clearing it away for God to lay out his plans. What do I do now? That's what you do. When authority is present, you yield to that authority and you ask what needs to be done. This is living in the fear of the Lord. Joshua realized in that moment that whatever his best battle plan would have been, could have been really good, but he realized whatever it was, it wouldn't work if he didn't first clear it with the actual authority that was present. And I don't mean to say that your plans are dumb or that you're wrong and you don't have good sense. (laughs) We do. God gave us all good sense. And he made us in his image. So, But he gives, and he gives us wisdom and common sense. And he walks beside us and he strengthens and he blesses. So it's not that I'm saying that your thinking is all wrong. Many times when you ask him what to do, he'll say, go ahead and do what you were thinking. That's good. It's a good plan. But regardless of the outcome, what you do isn't nearly as important as how you go about it. He wants to be acknowledged. Because sometimes, sometimes he has a plan that you you know nothing about. Joshua got a battle plan from God that was nowhere near the plan he would have thought of on his own. I can confidently assume that marching around the walls and singing and screaming, never touching a thing, Never taking a stance of war was not a potential plan that Joshua had in mind. I'm, pr- I'm pretty confident in that. No human would think of that. That was a God idea. Or a crazy person's, but it was a God idea. <laughs> Joshua would have never known. He could have never guessed that would be God's plan of action to defeat this walled city of Jericho if he hadn't stopped himself and repositioned under the authority of God's man, and asked, what should I do next? Because sometimes God will just throw the playbook out. Sometimes he opens up an avenue of victory that you never 
saw coming. The children of Israel won a lot of battles in their conquest for Canaan, all of them in the traditional way. All of them were with battle plans and swords and direct invasion of their city gates. This was the only battle that didn't go that way. For this one, God had something different, different adversary, different strength, different method of interaction. And God knew all that better than Joshua did. It's God and Joshua strategizing, working it out together. God makes the plan, and then Joshua concedes to God's authority because he knows he's better at planning than him. So Joshua executes it exactly as God commands, and they get the victory every single time. Joshua never lost one battle except for one. He didn't ask God what to do. And then he went back, and he asked God what to do, and then he went and won that battle too. That's a great track record. This is because from the beginning, he understood one simple thing. I'm not in charge here. I'm going to carry out the victory because it's where God placed me, but I'm not the one that's making the battle plans. There will be so many times where the situation we're facing is something we have full knowledge and capability. We're very capable to deal with it. Been there, done that. We know how to deal with this thing, know how to go about it. And maybe you think it's your job. It's your burden, your responsibility. I can, I've got this. I don't need anybody else to worry about this. I can figure it out on my own. Why do I need to get God involved when I know I got it in control? I got it figured out. And if that's the way you see it, look at Joshua. Why does God sometimes have a different plan than the one that's been tried and tested? He knows better than you. He's God. He's in control. If we're going to live in the fear of the Lord, then we have to be comfortable with this. We have to be comfortable with him calling the shots in every aspect of our lives, even when we think we're up to the task ourselves. So if God tells you to do something weird, something unconventional, maybe it's something out of character even for you to do. He's pushing you a little bit. Do it. And if he says, go right ahead with your plan, it's good. Good job. Do it. If he tells you to sit still, and don't take action, don't do anything, just wait, then do it. Because it's not about the specific outcome, it's about the pattern and the process in your position with him. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Now, according to that scripture, it seems to me that God is not obligated to direct our paths if we're not acknowledge him, acknowledging him in all our ways. If we're leaning into our own understanding, then often what he'll do is he'll just let it play out. We get to learn a lesson. Yeah. Woohoo! God's he's pretty good about letting us have our way, letting our hard-headedness win, and just let whatever outcome happen. Even even with the best intentions, we go in with our plan without asking God's help, and then when it all falls apart, we're hurt and we're confused, and we cry out to God. And he helps us. And that's when he turns things around. Like a good father, he comes and he cleans up your mess. He picks you up and he pats you on the back and he says, we're going to be okay. Let's try this again. And he'll let you do that over and over and over until you're tired of suffering. <laughs> and you realize that you've got to give it to him. And so it all comes back to an acknowledged dependence on him and a voluntary repositioning of yourself to put him in the seat of authority, whatever it takes. And then asking him what to do. And we have a really hard time giving God the authority because that means we have to move out of the way. And that's why it's so critical that we're continually fasting, praying, and reading our Bible. Because this kills our flesh. The flesh that doesn't want to leave the seat. That's the main struggle here. Our flesh doesn't want to get off the seat to let God occupy it. So we have to deny our flesh because when we deny our flesh, it gets weaker. It gets easier to push it off the boss chair and allow God to occupy it. So Joshua said, what would you have me do? The captain said, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. And Joshua obeyed. Joshua's scouting trip turned into a worship service. When you acknowledge God, get him in the right position and ask him what to do, it'll all work out, and his spirit will be with you through it. Do you know what happened when Joshua got the instructions on how to defeat Jericho and execute it? It worked. Yeah. And it didn't work because of Joshua, or because of the army, or because of the musicians. It worked for one reason. It worked because it was God's plan. 
So I'm coming to a close. I know this isn't a complicated thought, but no matter where we are in our relationship with God, we forget this. Or if we're in the start of our relationship, our walk with God, we don't fully understand what it means to fear God. It's so against human nature. It's so against our own understanding, but it's so important. Submission, surrender to God is one of the key factors in living for him. And we can avoid so much pain, so much heartache when we do it. And I'm not saying that you're going to be free of all of life's pain and trials, but so much of what we go through is caused by a lack of submission to God's authority. So let's stand. As human beings living on this planet, we're constantly battling our flesh. It's normal that we're going to fall short over and over. But I'm thankful that God does come back and he picks up the pieces and he turns it around for good. He uses our mistakes to make something beautiful. But his desire is that we first allow him to direct us. His plans are perfect and and pushing myself off of the control seat is necessary if I want to please him and to fulfill his promises. So if you want to respond and take this opportunity to either align yourself with God or even just to make sure there's nothing that you're keeping from him, the altars are open. Take this opportunity to allow God to speak into you and to give you some battle plans for what you're facing. This is a moment. This is a moment.